Hello and welcome everyone. I am Dr. Taylor Wilmer and I'm here representing the National Social Anxiety Center, also known as INSAC. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist at the Center for Anxiety and Behavioral Change, which is the Montgomery County, Maryland and Northern Virginia Regional Clinic for INSAC. And at INSAC, we are committed to providing mental health professionals with knowledge and expertise to broaden the quality and availability of treatment for social anxiety disorder. And in service of this goal, we offer interviews with researchers and clinicians who have expertise in social anxiety disorder treatment. So today, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with Dr. Rick Heimberg, my friend and mentor, who has a long career devoted to understanding and treating social anxiety disorder. Dr. Heimberg is the Thaddeus L. Bolton Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology at Temple University, where he founded and directed a specialty social anxiety clinic for 25 years. He is a past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies and the Society for a Science of Clinical Psychology. And he is a recipient of the of Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, the Academy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and the Philadelphia Behavior Therapy Association. He has published nearly 500 articles, chapters, and books on understanding and treating anxiety, including the Managing Social Anxiety, a, behavioral, a Cognitive Behavioral Approach Workbook, which was released in its third edition in November 2019. So welcome, Rick, and thanks so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. So I have a few uh, questions for you and really look forward to talking with you about your research and your treatment on social anxiety disorder. And so to, to kick us off, the first question I have for you is, during your career, what have you learned about social anxiety or treatment for social anxiety that surprised you? It's a daunting question. There's so much <laughs> that I've really had the chance to have the privilege to learn. And I'm always amazed and always surprised, even though it's not yesterday that, that first came to me. These are the bravest, most courageous, and most resilient people you can possibly know. People with social anxiety disorder face challenges every day, and more or less, and more or less with our help. Uh, they go out into the world and face challenges that uh, at some point or another seem overwhelming to them. Um, it seems to me that they are among the warmest, kindest, most appealing human beings if we have the opportunity to get to know them. And if anything, they are too kind and too forgiving of others. And if we could get them to be a little bit less that way, they could have a much easier time in the community of man. You know, so, you know, as I think about that, uh, there are two things that come to my mind that at some point along the way surprised me. One is how harsh their self-criticism is. You know, they set standards for themselves that are not just aspirational, but commanding. And that are so high that they can't get there. And then they are brutal on themselves, where they're kind to everybody else, about their failure to make what it is that they believe that they should have accomplished. You know, you know that brings me to start thinking about, and we've done some research over the years on the intersection between social anxiety and perfectionism. You know, and you know, I think the, that description is apt in that the person with social anxiety disorder will examine their behavior 
under a very high resolution microscope and find the smallest things that are wrong and make them into very big things. You know, and that basically brings us right into the realm of perfectionism. People who do research on perfectionism talk about, quote, clinical perfectionism, you know, which is the intersection of unrelentingly high standards and unrelentingly harsh self-criticism. And that's a bad place to be. And when it has to do with how you're coming across in interaction with other people or in front of other people or performing in the ways that we all have to perform in life, then you're basically in the land of social anxiety disorder. I think that makes that makes a lot of sense. And it's especially the way the ways in which you describe the people who we see with social anxiety in emphasizing and highlighting their resilience and their kindness and their compassion that they care so much, so much about other people. And then it can be so hard to hear about that negative self-criticism that they turn inward. Um, and they, they very often have the very mistaken notion that if they back off on the self-criticism that they will allow themselves to behave in worse ways, which is the internal justification that keeps the self-criticism going. Have you found that it's important or helpful for clinicians to name that perfectionism in the room or focus that in a, focus on that in a specific way in treatment? Uh, almost always. Um, I don't know if it's necessary to use the word perfectionism, but it is important to talk about high standards and the difference between aspirational standards and standards that are just too high that you're never going to get there and that you're going to beat yourself up about. And it's important to give a name to the self-critic. Hmm. Do you usually name that as anxiety or as something separate from anxiety? Um, very similar to the way that people talk about OCD in a way that externalizes the OCD. Uh, that's your OCD making you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually, on occasion, and you probably heard about this when you were a student at Temple, uh, talked about the social anxiety monster that we sometimes call Sam, social anxiety monster. Uh, right. yeah. uh, and uh, talked with, used that metaphor with some patients like Sam sitting on your shoulder and telling you that you can't do anything and you need to be done with Sam. Right. Returning to your, your basic question, um, one of the other things that I've learned, and this you also know because we specifically worked on these things together, is how good people with social anxiety disorder are at suppressing the expression of their emotions. No. Some, I believe, they don't think they have the right or they don't have a soapbox or if, people, if they spoke up, people wouldn't listen. Or if we look at some research on relationships, they choose not to rock the boat because a rocky relationship is better than no relationship at all. We also know from lots of research on expressive suppression, a lot of it by my collaborator, James Gross, and his minions of students and colleagues, <laughs> uh, that uh, expressive suppression leads to more of a flat way of coming across that's less appealing to whoever it is you're interacting with, which is very much a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, people like you less if you suppress your emotional expression. But if you're suppressing your emotional expression for the purposes of not being disliked, 
You may not be disliked, but you won't be liked either. Right, and to achieve the opposite of the goal that you're hoping for. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. I've been I've been struck by just th thinking about the you mentioned before beliefs about high expectations and the idea that high expectations are important to have because they you know keep people um, you know they 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 feel important to have because they keep people connected and that they wouldn't be as good of a person if they didn't have those high expectations for themselves and similar beliefs about emotion that that showing emotion signals weakness or is going to be off-putting or burdensome to other people in some ways when actually it's it's the exact opposite yeah, and some of our early research showed that people with social anxiety truly endorse the belief that showing emotions is a sign of weakness now that's certainly not only people with social anxiety disorder there are plenty of people in the community at large or the world at large who think the way to handle emotions is to tough them out rather than to be expressive. Mm -hmm. If it becomes a lifestyle in somebody with social anxiety, it's going nowhere good. Um, it extends even to expression about positive emotions. Um, my friend and colleague Todd Cashton has done a fair amount of research about sharing positive experiences and the positive affect that goes along with them uh, in the context of relationships. And people with social anxiety don't do that. And they also don't show as much positive affect in response to their relationship partners bringing good news home. They don't want to show the negative parts of themselves and they don't engage the positive parts of themselves. So they're building a kind of a narrow box for themselves to stay in. Right, especially when emotions are gonna come up and they're gonna to have to manage those and try to manage them without expressing them. It's really hard. It takes a lot of energy and takes a lot of- Emotions are a focus. normal part of human experience. Mm -hmm. And if you can get somebody with social anxiety disorder to believe that, then you really won a large part of the battle. Absolutely. And so thinking about that in a, a treatment context, are the ways that you recommend working that into treatment as well? The relevance of it will vary from client to client, but almost everything that would show up on a fear hierarchy for a socially anxious client has to do with performing in front of others or interacting with others and as kind of an undercurrent to it, the expression of emotion that's part of those everyday life experiences. Right. So, so that makes sense. So sort of incorporating that piece into the exposures that you would typically do on a social anxiety hierarchy, making sure to highlight that or emphasize that in some way. Yeah, and it, that may show up in subtle ways like making sure that voice volume is up, you know, making sure that if somebody has some emotional expression that's maybe leakage from their point of view, that they go ahead and express it more fully. You know, to say something like, I'm having a little trouble with being anxious right now, give me a second to collect my thoughts mm. as a way to normalize and bond with your audience, whether it's a one person you're talking to or you're actually giving a, a presentation where there would be an audience in the typical meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's actually reaching out and bonding human to human. Right, that, that's a con that, that helps strengthen a connection. Right. Rather than, rather than build up, uh, rather than cause a disconnection, which I think is oftentimes 
seems like what anxiety is predicting. It's going to push yes. people away, but actually it keeps them close. Right. And so that flows into another question that I had for you, um, which is thinking about the things that you've learned and the things that have surprised you over the course of your career working with social anxiety. Um, how have you changed the way the ways that you approach or the ways that you treat social anxiety based on these things? And we've talked, I guess, a little bit about it in terms of targeting perfectionism, uh, increasing emotion expressions or exposures. Are there other things that you've incorporated into treatment over the course of your career based on what you've learned? Um, um, some of the things that we've already talked about have been in our program for a long time, but not necessarily as overtly named as they might be now. Um, yeah, our program has always been very exposure-based and will always continue to be very exposure-based. Um, you know, and, and incorporates a lot of cognitive restructuring work for, but the cognitive restructuring work is not necessarily there for the purposes of strong arming somebody to think a particular way, but to help them see different options. And if it's something that happens, cognitive restructuring happens in two or three different ways. One being talking about a situation before entering into the situation. Second being practicing during the client practicing some self-administered cognitive restructuring during the situation. And the third being putting things together after the situation is over and post-processing them. Those things are for the purpose of highlighting different important aspects of the situation, getting somebody ready to see what's going to happen in a way that is maybe less biased than their automatically filtered way of viewing the world and keeping themselves at a relatively even keel during and looking at what actually happened in some way that is balanced and even after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. And the, those are the basic things about our program, exposures in session and between sessions and the client's real world. And kind of restructuring all the way along to help them understand and extract the information that the world has to give more fully. Right. Um, yeah, and that makes a lot of sense the, that that can happen before, during, or after right. the exposure. That doesn't have to be cognitive restructuring first and then, and then exposure second. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, um, some of the ways that we've changed over time um, is to, in some ways, get a little bit more behavioral. You know, exposure is pretty behavioral to begin with. Mm -hmm. But uh, more of a focus on safety behaviors, more of a focus on avoidance and cutting that off at every possible turn. And, and in the, that same context, understanding that there's a kind of avoidance that we often don't talk about. That's the situation never initiated. You know, there's, so there's somebody across the room that's appealing to you that you would like to talk to. There's not necessarily a situation that's being avoided there. But there's a situation that can be created that is an opportunity for all sorts of wonderful things. You know, if you will get up off your seat and walk across the room and initiate something with that person, maybe a silly kind of way, maybe not. But all of us have some memory from high school where one of our friends told one of our fr her friends told one of the friend told a friend told a friend that that person over there likes you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, you've never talked to them and you're scared to death to do it. And they never talk to you because they're scared to death to do it also. 
Yeah, and that's not necessarily about social anxiety disorder. It's about high school. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the opportunity that is missed by not taking advantage of that. It's not really avoidance. It's doing what you want to do and accomplishing what you want to accomplish. So that same focus also leads to something that's not unique to my therapy at all, but more of a focus on goals and values that the person has and how the goals of therapy match with that especially when we're asking patients to do things that are really hard and really scary for them. Um, if it's aligned with their values and, and bringing them closer to their goals, it, it kind of can create more motivation to take those scary steps. Right, absolutely. And help them lead a richer life. Are there, are there ways that you recommend or, or points during treatment that you recommend talking about values or clarifying values or working values into exposures in certain ways? Um, yes and yes. Um, the um, early parts of our protocol involves some psychoeducation about the different components of anxiety and so on. Yeah, yeah. At a pretty basic level, it's the physiological cognitive and behavioral. Um, in previous versions of our protocol, we put a lot of emphasis on the physiological and the cognitive in psychoeducation and didn't talk nearly so much about the behavioral. We're doing that more now and asking questions and having exercises that are directed around things like how am I acting in concert with my social anxiety rather than my goals? You know, which presupposes some work and some time spent on what are your goals. Right, right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially when framing framing exposures or avoidance uh, as, as including things like missed opportunities, mm -hmm. actions not taken or not initiated. Are there other things that you've worked into the most recent edition of your Managing Social Anxiety Workbook? There are two or three things that are worth mentioning. Uh, one of the things that ha has been in the prior versions is what we call the metaphor of the amber-colored glasses, you know, mm -hmm. which I know rings a bell with you just uh -huh. <laughs> because you've administered some the protocol so much. Mm -hmm. um, but we've initiated a series of exercises that go along with the introduction of that concept um, that basically ask the client to put the glasses on and take them off and look at the various situations, first with the glasses on, then with the glasses off, you know, with the general idea of educating them, drilling them, raising their awareness from moment to moment of when in real life they've got the glasses on and when they don't. Yeah. You know, I think that's an important thing that we underplayed in earlier versions of the manual. Yeah, yeah but I think one of the, the other parts of, of differences in our approach now is that we made a, a great effort in the third edition to emphasize situations that are relevant to people of marginalized identities. Yeah. Um, there are certain lots of certain situations that have to do with gender, that have to do with race, that have to do with LBGTQ identity um, that are unique and require a little bit different focus. For most of us, we hear people saying negative things about us from time to time, or we feel judged from time to time. And for people from majority identities, 
it's very often the case that it's the amber color glasses at work or there's some degree of judgment, but it's not necessarily severe and as awful as somebody with social anxiety disorder would automatically describe it to be. But when you have somebody who's transgender or gay, of color, or any of the intersections, all of those, add gender in the mix. Um, some of the judgments that are made by others or assumed by the person that are being made by others are often truer than we would like to admit. And it becomes very important for the person with social anxiety disorder and the, the additional identities that we're talking about here to understand the difference between what's the result of my wearing my amber color glasses and what's the result of my living in a world of judgmental people or people with biases uh, or people who are not behaving as well as we would like them to in a more perfect world. Uh, and so it leads to a need for the person to make a distinction between I'm worried that this person is negatively evaluating me because I've got social anxiety and therefore I should work to tweak my perception of their judgment versus there are people that think in ways that are not in line with my best interest, and I need to be careful there. And in the protocol, we call it the me versus not me distinction. Is it me? Is it my social anxiety? Is it my amber colored glasses? Is it my tendency to be biased and in interpreting things in a way that is negative and makes me feel bad? You know, or is there some real judgment here and maybe some real danger here and when we think about going into particular situations there may be a mix of social anxiety re related reactions and identity related reactions and the client needs to be helped to understand which things fall on which side yeah. so uh, we have an example in the, the workbook about a, a transgender woman who is going to visit her extended family for the first time since her transition. And she's worried that members of the extended family will not judge her well. And some of that is true. Some of that is her excessive worry. Some of it is because people are not accepted, accepting of transgender individuals. And she needed to learn to not take that stuff quite so personally, but to understand that she may need to have a safety plan around it. And to discriminate that from the parts of it that are just her social anxiety working, which she needs to learn to treat the same way as she would any other social anxiety. So that's a piece of, I hope, greater sensitivity than we've shown in previous versions of the protocol. Yeah, I think that's really important. That's great that that's incorporated. And I can see it not only being important for the patient or the client to be able to make that distinction, but also for the clinician to be aware of that and, and to assess for those sort of real world experiences based on a person's identity to get a sense of what they're experiencing. Absolutely. Sometimes in the clinician seat, we may not, we may not know what that's like on the other, on the other side of the, of the chair. Right. 
And you spoke to it a little bit, but I'm, I'm curious. So it sounds like there are just sort of different actions that, that a person might take depending on whether they're experiencing, ex identifying it as excessive worry versus identifying it as sort of true judgment or negative feedback from other people. Um, and you mentioned just uh, like a safety plan that sort of thinking about ways to stay, to stay safe and to use coping skills in those moments? Well, it, it may be as simple as saying, okay, I've had enough. I don't need to take this abuse. It's time to go home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or it may need to be, I need to make sure that I have access to means to leave. I'm, I may need to have some coping responses worked out with my therapist in advance for things that fall on the not me side as well as things that fall on the me side. You know, safety yeah. plan's a pretty broad term and I don't mean it at least 99% of the time. I don't mean it in terms of suicide kinds of things, which is where we usually hear that phrase. Right, right. You know, but basically, you're going into a situation that has some possibility of real judgment and potential real harm that comes from that judgment. Mm -hmm. And being aware of the distinction between that and the perceived judgment is a part of social anxiety disorder. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. I'm thinking a little bit about exposures um, sort of broadly. I'm curious about whether you have tips and tricks for enhancing exposures in social anxiety treatment and also what common pitfalls you see clinicians falling into and what recommendations you might make for them. I would say that the most common pitfall is relying on cognitive restructuring too much to do the work without tying it to exposure. Mm -hmm. which basically comes down to arguing with your client that the world is one way when they believe it's another. Yeah. Uh, it's often the case that beginning therapists believe that, especially for cognitive restructuring before a situation, that the goal point of that has to be transformed belief. And that would be nice. <laughs> but the goal is to facilitate the success of the exposure. You know, by wedging open their, their cognitions just a little bit, by giving them more opportunity to perceive the information that the exposure or behavioral experiment has to provide to them to be able to incorporate all that. But the real motor there, the real information that is formative and changing is what comes from the exposure. You know, cognitive restructuring is very important but it's about setting the stage if it's done before the exposure. It's about setting the stage and trying to maximize the possibility, first of all, that the person will enter the exposure situation. And secondly, that they'll be open to the learning that's there. You know, and that's all very important, but it's a much lower bar than the cognitive restructuring must do all the work. Right. It's a much more reachable bar. Right. Yeah, I, li I like that idea a lot of, cogn of cognitive restructuring as a, as a gateway to doing the exposure and this idea that, that you're, you're, as a clinician, you're not trying to pull your, pull your client fully over into the side of believing that cognitive restructuring 100%, but you're just trying to wedge the door open then right. a little bit. Yeah. As much as you can, but you don't necessarily expect to get all the way there. Right. Another thing. Are there that ways I that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, I mean, you might be following up with this, but I was, I was going to say, it, sort of to your point about uh, cognitive restructuring in the service of exposures, are there ways that you'd recommend getting in more exposure practice, whether it's multiple repetitions during a session or multiple homework assignments between sessions to make sure that it, the exposure is happening consistently? Yeah, it, I was going in a similar direction to that. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a concept that's really worth trying to, to bring your client into, and that's the exposure of lifestyle. Yeah. The idea that we'll do exposures in session or behavioral experiments in session and have a exposure homework assignment that's all fine. That's good. That's kind of the bedrock of the treatment. But the more that the person looks at life as a laboratory, you know, and every time there's a challenge to your social anxiety, that it's an opportunity for new learning. And the more that your client can take an attitude of leaning into that, the, the growth potential is enormous. If you assign homework for every day, which there may be circumstances where that's appropriate, but for the most part, if you assign homework assignments to do to something every day, then you're not going to get compliance. Maybe if you assign every day, you'll get it done two or three times, and maybe that's a good way to get it done two or three times. But if you help your client understand that if they treat your life as a laboratory for them to try new things and see how it turns out, to try new things and learn from that experience and try new things and fail and get back up and try it again, then the learning yield is exponentially larger. So I'm much more in favor of trying to get them to adopt something that approaches that kind of mental set Mm -hmm. than I am about assigning a certain number of homework assignments per a particular week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I love that idea of, of life as a laboratory or the or living the exposure lifestyle. And I, and I, I think that kind of sets an overarching goal of, of, of approaching rather than avoiding in situations where you have the option. And then also of, of being flexible. So it's, it's I think it's, it's nice to, you know, sort of like, this is my assignment, I will do this one thing, and then I'll move on. Um, it allows some flexibility and sort of whatever comes up, let's practice, practice, the, practice the skills of approaching anxiety rather than avoiding anxiety. And creating opportunities. To go back to our missed opportunity point of earlier on. Right, right. Um, there are a couple other things that, uh, that I thought of when I was thinking about the common pitfalls question. Mm -hmm. um, one is that it's easy to develop a hierarchy and then stay pretty rigidly attached to it. Basically treating a hierarchy as a structure rather than a set of guideposts. Mm. The idea of systematic graduated exposure is nice in terms of getting client buy-in because you can start with a simpler thing and move up just a little bit at a time. And that's so much more appealing than let's start at the top. But there are a couple of things that are worth thinking about. If you are at all knowledgeable about inhibitory learning theory, not you personally, but a 
psychologists in general. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is not necessarily to go step by step up the hierarchy. It's to figure out ways to maximize the violation of one's expectations. And the socially anxious person's expectation is basically some variation of I can't do it or there will be bad consequences if I do do it. Now, the higher up the hierarchy you are with that, the, and you get better and you get good results, the more learning would be predicted by inhibitory learning theory. Mm -hmm. Also, it just doesn't make sense to to stick rigidly to a hierarchy, even if you're going generally in a graded way, because it robs you of the opportunity of molding your second exposure based on what you learned from the experience in the first. So if you're starting off with something about small talk, and your client's initial automatic thought that you're looking at in cognitive restructuring is, I won't know what to say. Well, you can easily enough design an exposure around that. And they may or may not be able to come up with things to say. But even if they do beautifully on that, you might learn from witnessing an exposure if it's done in session. You might witness that they get into trouble when they deal with silences. And so next week, do you go up to the next item on the hierarchy, which is job interviews, or do you, do you stay with the conversation about small talk and focus on silences? If you're too rigid about sticking to the hierarchy, then you lose the opportunity to do the second one. And it's a clinical decision, which is a better one to do, and it may differ by client. But flexibility as a therapist is as important as flexibility as a client. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I can, the example that you just gave also, I could see it happening both ways, right? Maybe, maybe job interviews is towards the top of the hierarchy, but all of a sudden your client it's applying for jobs. Right. And so that, right. you know, you need to jump to that, right? Yeah. Or if you're dealing with a college student and you've got a class presentation and it's tomorrow. Right. <laughs> right. You're not going to wait until you get to the top of the hierarchy before tackling that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Fantastic. I think that's really helpful in thinking about how to how to how to flexibly think about exposures and increase uh, opportunities for that, both in session and out of session. So just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, I know you have done a lot of work with social anxiety in a group therapy context um, and treating social anxiety disorder in a group therapy context. And so would love to hear a little bit about your thoughts on um, the relative effectiveness of group cognitive behavioral therapy for social anxiety versus individual cognitive behavioral therapy for social anxiety, considerations for one versus the other, uh, and any thoughts about differences there? Well, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, some, if you look at the literature that's compared the two, but the, the research is really not very good quality for one thing. Hmm. But for another thing, the, if you take a tally of whether they're different or not, the scorecard comes out fairly equal. And if you look at meta-analyses, for the most part, the uh, confidence intervals that are surrounding the effect sizes are overlapping. So there's really not a lot of sound difference in terms of efficacy data to select one versus the other. Mm -hmm. The National Health Service of the United Kingdom believes that individual therapy 
either the protocol developed by David Clark or the protocol developed by me. Uh, it should be the first line of defense. And the WIST group therapy is quite a bit further down uh, the list. And they don't recommend it. And I'm, I've never been quite satisfied with their reasons, which I won't go into here. Okay. Um, but from my point of view, there's not much difference in terms of empirical basis to pick one for versus the other. There are some clinical considerations. It's sometimes hard to get really anxious patients to accept a group. So you need to be ready to provide some individual therapy before you bring up a group to them or before you think that they're ready to handle a group. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the majority of patients. The majority of patients will be willing to accept what it is that you've got to offer. Um, group therapy is arguably better for people who have basically no social system, mm. who see very few people, who are not going to be in a position to work on certain kinds of situations that require a basic social group to, to be able to work on. If you're working on talking to cashiers and you know, people, salespeople and other people that you can run into anywhere, you don't need group therapy for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But for friendship building conversations and things like that, um, at some point or another, you can certainly expect your client to enter into real life social situations, but it might not be something that makes sense right off the bat. You know, now you can work with that in individual therapy by bringing in therapy confederates, or you can work on it with a group of clients who have more or less similar goals. So there's some benefit to group therapy in that circumstance right. that might not make a difference for somebody who's higher functioning or more, more socially connected despite their anxiety. You know, but there's, a, there's a, a way that we haven't really examined our group and individual therapy in the context of social anxiety that's similar to group and individual therapy in the context of, say, dialectical behavior therapy, mm. where you have both and they serve different functions. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things, I, I know no research that really gets directly at this, but I could easily see a circumstance in a group practice, especially in a group practice from the National Center, Social Anxiety Center, mm -hmm. uh, where there are groups that are populated by people who are in individual therapy within a larger practice. Mm -hmm. And the groups provide um, an opportunity for exposures that are selected based on some sort of consultation with the individual therapist as well as with the client. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, it may be that the answer to your question is not either or, but both in that kind of integrated way. But we don't have any research yeah. to particularly guide us in that direction, but that would be something that would be great for people at, in insect centers to, to pursue because they have the facilities to do it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, it would be fantastic to see data on that. And, and even, even slowly, solely from a clinical perspective, that makes a lot of sense because I can see something that you might 
lose in a group setting is, is sort of the time and the space to really individually tailor a hierarchy. And you can do that on an individual basis. And then the groups provide such rich opportunities for exposures. And so being able to, to have a really tailored hierarchy that you can then use for exposures in the group. Plus, like you were talking about that, that added benefit of the fact that people with social anxiety are oftentimes very socially isolated, don't have many opportunities for connection. And so you get that extra bonus of a group in terms of social connection and opportunities to feel like you're not alone, which can be so powerful. We have a recent paper from a group therapy, uh, RCT, that shows that group treatment, whether it's CBT or mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, that treatment of social anxiety disorder predicts reduction in loneliness. Mm. Yeah, and that's from group treatment. And then in right. that particular study, so that's really interesting. And that was and that was across treatment uh, types. That was there was no difference both. treatment no types. Difference. Okay, okay. And so so I'll put that put that sort of as an idea to bring back to the clinic. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, one last question: um, Given your research and clinical work over the course of your career. Do you have any thoughts on, on where the field of social anxiety should go next in terms of both research and clinical work? Uh, or what do you think is missing from our understanding and treatment of social anxiety disorder? That's a whole nother hour in that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there, there are some things that are fairly low hanging fruit to think about. Yeah. One is, not about social anxiety disorder per se, although you could think about it in terms of comorbidity. Uh, but what's the role of social anxiety in other disorders? And is there a role for social anxiety treatment or something that looks like treatment for SAD? But might be uh, not necessarily for people who meet the diagnostic criteria in other disorders, you know, like eating disorders bulimia in particular. Mm -hmm. um, body dysmorphic disorder is very close to social anxiety in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, eating disorders, I had, I had an experience long ago. I was still in my position that I was at before I came to Temple. Um, I got involved with a group of, of people who were doing treatments for bulimia and asked them whether or not I could try doing the very the version of group therapy we were doing at the time for social anxiety with them and whether or not and my question was whether or not that treatment would produce changes in bulimia more broadly than just the social anxiety. Hmm. And we had a group of just a few people and we did it entirely clinically and never pursued it as a research project. But the clinical finding was that there were, everybody who was selected, all of us probably a bit biased, showed social anxiety symptoms as a big part of their presenting um, presenting concerns. Mm -hmm. And all of them showed reduction in both social anxiety and bulimic symptoms as a result of the clinical treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Now we didn't pursue that particular line of treatment. You know, but I know uh, a student of mine, Rachel Bowler, and other people at other labs like Sherry Levinson at Louisville are pursuing imaginal exposure as a treatment for, for eating disorders. That's not necessarily social anxiety treatment, but it's anxiety treatment, and there's not that much difference. Yeah, so, um, 
So is there a place for social anxiety oriented treatment to be integrated into the treatment of other disorders? I think that's a really interesting, interesting question, especially, especially for disorders like eating disorders, like substance use disorders, where the disorder is capturing essentially a maladaptive coping behavior. Um, and, and so thinking about, can we address some of the underlying uncomfortable emotions, whether it's anxiety, social anxiety, or something else in order to then see changes in those coping behaviors? Right, yeah, and substance yeah. abuse is probably another area where that would have lots of relevance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I thought about other things like predictors of outcome is something that we haven't done very well or very much of. You know, we could spend hours on talking about what different ones might be. Same is true for mediators. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the issue with mediators is that they're so important because basically they were, when we're talking about mediators of treatment change, we're talking about the targets that move, that produce the movement in the ultimate outcome. But most all of the research that's been done hasn't been set up in a way where there's appropriate temporal precedence or, you know, which means that the mediator is measured before the outcome. And mm -hmm. the mediator is demonstrated to change before the outcome changes. You know, very little of the research that we have meets those criteria. And it's hard, even if you have three measurement points. You know, like we recently have a, had a study uh, that we do with James Gross and uh, Amanda Morrison, a former student of mine, was first author showing that positive affective empathy, which is the ability to share in and understand the positive emotions of another, yeah. is, def is deficient in people with social anxiety disorder. And improvements in it mediate change in social anxiety. And we were able to show it with tem temporal precedence because um, change in empathy at post-test predicted change in social anxiety at follow-up. But most of the studies, including that one, don't rule out the possibility that social anxiety is changing earlier. Mm but it's not necessarily measured with fine enough granularity to be able to say that empathy, empathy changed on this day and social anxiety didn't change until this day. Mm -hmm. It's a hard charge. And so, so we know very little about what are the true mechanisms of action behind our treatment. The more we know about that, the more efficient we can be. Right, right. In terms of focusing, focusing our treatment interventions on targeting those specific mechanisms to then see symptom reduction at the end. Right. I thought also a little bit about how best to combine treatments. And we've already talked about one variation of that that I had on my list to discuss. Uh, the thing about group and individual treatments being combined. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you know, I've over my career been involved in a number of studies that look at comparisons and contrasts of CBT versus medication treatments. And it's always a question of what's the best way to think about those things. You know, certainly there are some people that think that it should always be psychological treatments and some people think it should always be medication treatments, but neither one of them are particularly realistic. You know, and, right. you know, should we start everybody on a medication and save the more uh, 
highly sought after, less easily available CBT therapists for those people who don't do well on meditation. So that, that suggests a particular kind of sequential research design. Mm -hmm. Where you treat everybody in an open trial of meditation and then take the people who don't do well or don't do well enough and treat them further on, you know, and maybe randomize them to another medication, randomize them to placebo, randomize them to CBT at that particular point. Right. And thinking about those treatments, I like the idea of thinking about treatments as not either or, but perhaps both in a combination that's going to be most effective for the most, the biggest, the largest number of people. We need to think not as CBT therapists, but as clinicians who have our clients' best interest at heart. Mm -hmm. That means the more weapons there are in the total tool bag across all professionals, the better. Another combination of treatment that's worth thinking about that we all do, or we are many of us do, but has not been very well researched, is combining mindfulness approaches to CBT approaches. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more of that combination going on. And I think with utility, then there has been research to give it uh, empirical status. And, and you were just talking about the, the James Gross's study of CBT, group CBT versus group mindfulness-based stress reduction. And again, maybe it's not either or, but how can we how can we merge them to get the most out of the interventions that we're providing? Right. Well, thank you so much, Rick. It's been it's been wonderful to chat with you about all of this. And I really appreciate you taking the time to answer some of our questions and talk about your thoughts on the clinical and the research side of social anxiety disorder. And uh, and I really learned a lot. I think the other people who watch this video will really learn a lot and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me.